I'm Kristen Mallon, certified nurse midwife here with Dr. Yaakov Abdelik, high-risk perinatologist and MFM specialist, and this is True Birth. Today we're talking all about occiput posterior position, the most common fetal malposition. It's important because it's associated with abnormalities of labor and can be associated with assisted vaginal delivery and even cesarean delivery. Take a listen as Dr. Abdelik explains. Today's topic is going to be difficult deliveries, assisted vaginal deliveries, also known as operative vaginal deliveries, but we don't like to use the word operative. It sounds scary, so invasive and technical. And yes, yeah, scary. Assisted sounds like, oh, well, mom's doing 90%. And we're just going to help her out a little, little bit. A little bit. Just give her a little, little yeah. pointer in the right direction. Who doesn't want an assistant? Everybody wants an assistant. So, you and, know, in delivery um, too. And we're going to throw into that. We're going to talk about occipital posterior, which means the baby is head is down, but facing the wrong direction. Right, meaning, sunny side up. People call it sunny side up a lot. Right, sunny side up because if a woman is delivering in a standard uh, dorsal supine or on her back position in like uh, kind of leg holders, the baby will come out looking at the ceiling instead of the floor. Especially if it's your first baby. It's even, it's like that's oh, the yeah. hardest. Everything's hard. Everything times two if it's the first baby. So that's, I think women worry about that a lot. Should they worry about that? Yes. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Why does it happen? Is there anything you can do about it? And what are the options for your doctor or midwife or provider if it is the case? Or, or doula or labor coach too, even, right? Yes, that's true, even labor coach. Okay, so let's start from the top. So why does it happen? Why does the occiput, which is the back of the head, kind of where you would, I always say, wear a yarmulke or a cap, why does that position happen when the baby is supposed to come out facing the floor, not facing the sky? You know how I work, right? We don't start with why. Why does the bad thing happen? We start with why should the good thing usually happen? All right, let's start there. Right. I okay, mean, why should the good thing... You make thing... it sound like babies know which way to be lined up. And well, this kid is just confused. Yeah, I mean, could be. But we uh, talked about why babies are 96% of the time head down. Now, let's talk about even if they're head down, how do they know to be facing up, down, sideways, or not? Do babies really know? Or how, how, how did that happen that the majority of babies are facing the correct way, which is looking, the occiput is anterior. The back of the head is towards the mother's belly. Right. So this I got to know, because I didn't know that there was a confirmed, all the scientists had agreed on the answer to this question. I don't think you can say that about anything. That's true. Is the earth flat? Right. There's a Facebook page somewhere. Right. Okay. So we, we know statistically that the vast, the majority, even I would say 70, 80% of babies are occiput anterior. And we also know that uh, it's a much easier delivery and the baby gets stuck posterior much more often. Right. So occiput so anterior is the likes favored. occiput anterior. Occiput anterior, which is facing the floor, not sunny side up. Is the preferred position for the baby's head. So why would it, why does it usually come out of occiput anterior? Because um, that fit of the baby's head and the fit of the pelvis, the baby has the ability to rotate because um, no matter which way the shoulders are, the baby can rotate easily. Uh, 90 degrees and you know the baby's you know a neutral position would be the baby's facing its chest if it had a facing chest but the baby can rotate towards either shoulder so the baby can easily rotate to an anterior or posterior position and the architecture of the pelvis sh in a screw-like fashion should actually uh, urge or push the baby into this anterior, anterior. position right? right and then there's the the baby can kind of go either way it can do a short turn like a 90 de degree turn, or it can do like a 270 turn. Am I doing my math? Yeah, right? yeah, that's like the omen. No, what was it? The, was it who was it? No, the exorcist. Yeah, if your baby does a 360 degree head <laughs> not, turn. Not all the way, but like a three quarter <laughs> turn. Isn't that long arc rotation versus, versus short arc rotation? Baby's heads are very flexible and next very, they have tremendous latitude. Yes, they, a baby can, you'd be surprised how, how far a baby can turn its head. Um, but um, the majority of babies do come out, well, Let's take this from the top. A baby's inside the womb and it's uh, not laboring. So the mom's not in labor, so the baby's head is, let's say, it's floating. It's, it's, it's kind of in the pelvis, but it's not really making its way out. And we'll call that minus three station, meaning it's high up. And right, then so the mom goes into labor. Right, so let's just talk about station real quick. So zero station is the baby's, the sides of the baby's head are perfectly even with the pelvis. And that's kind of like when the baby's coming down, transcending into the pelvis. Zero station means that the widest part of right. the baby's the, head... The bipyridal diameter, which exactly most people don't know what that is. ...fits exactly into the pelvic inlet, so the baby fits. Zero station is when the baby's head is about, uh, just to give this layman speak, uh, just 
two inches inside the vaginal canal. Like you go in two inches, you find the baby's head around there. That means, generally speaking, depending on the mother and the size, that means the baby's zero station or engaged or just right the widest part of the head just got through the most narrow part of the pelvis, and then we're going to go plus one, plus two, plus three, baby out. But the other direction would be minus one, minus two, minus three, and the baby minus three, above minus three means the head's not even in the pelvis, then it drops into the pelvis, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, engaged, then plus one, plus two, plus three, baby's out. Right, so it's like integers, like negative integers and positive integers. I mean, I learned minus five and plus five. Same thing. Yeah. The, the three scale is, is not actual units. It's just uh, dividing the space equally. So mm-hmm. let's get back to the focus here. Um, baby is floating or not yet really in labor. Mom, mom's not in labor and the head is down, but not in any particular position. And if you go to your doctor and say, you know, doc, I'm, 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 I'm due in a week. Could you tell me what position the baby's head is in? It would be meaningless because even if they could tell you with an ultrasound, it wouldn't have anything to do with what position your baby's head's going to be. Right. So the baby could be facing the side, could be facing the back and the front, and it wouldn't matter because the baby's head is floating minus three or higher. And then as the baby comes down, certain things happen to help the baby fit. One of them is the baby's head flexes. Okay. So so that tucks the chin. Cardinal movements of labor. So uh, the head's coming down, and then all of a sudden it hits this bony pelvis, and it flexes, meaning all of a sudden the baby's head, the chin, is now up against the chest. The baby's head is completely flexed. This way the occiput, or the top of the head, is leading, and the baby's head is as narrow as possible to fit out, meaning right, so I think that is the that, least diameter that the baby can get into. Right, so I think another way to kind of think about it is like if you're kind of sinking to the bottom of a pool and your head hits the bottom of the pool, your head most of the time is going to tuck towards your chin versus the other way, tuck right. away. Right, it extends, it's a problem because that's not going to fit for Right, so you want off. flexion. You, you want... want flexion because it makes the head the as, as narrow and as long and narrow as possible, so it fits. Right, and things so like flexion, somersault. And then internal rotation. Internal rotation is a problem. So internal rotation should be that the head, instead of being neutral, facing forward, it should turn towards the shoulder. And that shoulder, because the shoulders are sideways compared to the mother, and that shoulder that it turns to should be the one where the baby's looking at the lower shoulder, not the upper shoulder. And if the baby's looking at the lower shoulder, then the baby's in the right position, it's looking down. But if you're looking at the upper shoulder, then the baby's occiput. And so when you say lower shoulder, you mean the shoulder that's closer to the mother's back. And the floor, yes. Right. So internal rotation, flexion, flexion should happen. So the baby rotates uh, facing down, but the baby might be flexing in the uh, ex- opposite internally direction. rotating the opposite direction, then extension. Now, if the baby's head is looking down, extension is actually the chin coming off the chest and coming all the way up, and that's actually the head coming out. When the head comes out of the uh, birth canal, it's by extension. The head is not just simply descending out, but the baby is lifting its head up and making an appearance. The face is coming out from under the, from the skin of the perineum and voila, there's right. your baby. So let's back up a little bit about the different so- shapes of pelvises because... No, no, we're way off topic already. We, we're still trying to get back to why there's occipital posterior. That also has to do with the shape of the pelvis, theoretically. Right, right. And, and that might be a whole big conversation. Um, maybe we'll get back to it. But let's... Why then does a baby internally rotate in the wrong direction? So the answer is... Not clear, but I will tell you, and every obstetrician knows this, and you probably also see this, sometimes the baby's OP until the mom's literally pushing the baby out, and you see right in front of your eyes, as the baby's head's coming out, you know, the, the multi- total rotation. the baby's head completely rotates, and the baby comes out, right? It's as she's pushing, you see the head turning, 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 descending, and then boom, it's like a screw coming right out, right. and the baby comes out. I mean, do you really think it's only 10% of women? Because I feel like it's more than that. That are OP? Is that just our population? No, I think that's the ones you remember because the that's easy, true. The easy deliveries <laughs> are just <laughs> fine. You just stand right. there and make sure the baby's right. okay. And, and and you know we're not talking about OP in labor. We're talking about OP at delivery because OP in labor doesn't mean anything. They turn, and if you end up doing a section, you might say it was because of OP. The baby was posterior, but maybe that has nothing to do with it. But sometimes the babies don't turn. Sometimes they don't turn. That's correct. So the reason a baby turns, and this is what I'm trying to establish, is that as it descends, there are grooves, mechanics that are just part of physics that push the baby's head around. And sometimes that happens early and sometimes it happens late. And if it happens late and the baby will turn, but the baby never gets that deep, then we're going to say, oh, this baby did not come out because it's occipital posterior. But really what happened was it didn't come out because it was a really chunky baby. And if the body would have come down a little further, then the head would have rotated. It wasn't the 
The head that the rotation wasn't the problem, the head wasn't the problem, but the body was the problem. This is the whole nature back right. theory here. Getting right? back into the, the guts of everything. But a big baby necessarily or doesn't necessarily have a big head? No. So um, overweight babies don't necessarily have overweight heads. Actually, there's not a lot of place for fat on the head, right? When a baby's born, you don't see a lot of fat deposits under the skull. You might have big chipmunk che- cheeks. Right. So it's but, really about the big body. Right. Right. So I'm saying an overweight baby, an oversized bo- baby, may not come out because the body doesn't want to follow the head. So the head's doing the head everything right. And the head is posterior, right. but not because it won't rotate. It will rotate eventually. But the and, body is. But it can't come low enough to rotate. So we're just going to end up blaming the head, calling this failed labor because the baby was posterior. But meanwhile, the whole thing was that, yeah, baby was just too big and the head didn't rotate because you didn't labor enough and it couldn't come down enough to rotate. So then what about what every woman says is that they, if they get in a certain position, if they do hands and knees, if they, that the baby's head, the heaviest part will rotate and it will get into the proper position, which is the face is facing the floor. So if they we, do hands and knees or they, the do, time. We, we or they do rebozo or they do. Putting patients in very specific positions very often makes a big difference. We, right. So this is where all. like your midwife, doula, labor coach. Very could, important to know, um, to the have these little the... bag of tricks to help get. So what I find is one of the most important uh, positions to help a baby that's not uh, descending is the peanut ball between the legs. Right. So the peanut ball is like Do we that. have a name for that? Is there a midwife name for that? I think it's called the peanut ball. That's it? Yeah. I mean, it looks like, like Mr. Sideways. Peanut. The mother is sideways and you take this. Peanut shaped. Ball. But the, I mean, it, I mean, it's you yoga know, ball. one side to the other. It's like a foot and a half. It's like, a, you know, it's a wide ball. Right. So and it's, you put it's that like a yoga ball or a physio ball, an exercise ball, but it's shaped like Mr. And Peanut. You're opening the pelvis really wide and the mother's on her side. So I think you're trying to neutralize uh, the flop of the uterus meaning the baby's not angled in either direction. You're trying to get the baby in the center and you're trying to open the pelvis. And I think that position is very effective to help the baby drop. So it's also, some people call it the rock climber position. So you kind of like put the woman on her side and she has like one leg up, like she's kind of climbing up a rock. Okay. All right. Do you see and, what I'm saying? And if you don't have a peanut ball, sometimes they just use a, a tray table where you just, you're lifting, you know, one leg is on the bed and the, the, the higher leg is really elevated uh, upwards and knee bent and you're really uh, opening up the pelvis. Right, or blankets. I mean, we could include a picture in the show notes so okay. people could take a look and see what we're talking uh, about. Yes, that, that that does help. And I reason, believe the reason that it helps is that it, um, it opens up the pelvis as much as possible. But more importantly, it straightens out the uterus and the pelvis so that the baby is coming down at the right angle. So what point in labor do you think it's important to identify the position of the baby? Like two centimeters it matters or? It's hard because to feel the position of the baby, you have to really be able to feel the whole head. And at two centimeters, you've got a very limited amount of head you're feeling. And the head is still kind of high, presumably. That's so two centimeters, centimeters doesn't matter. Maybe more like eight, it matters. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, either... You're thinking about the position of the head because things are slowing down or stalling, and then you're trying to figure out why, or because you know she's pushing and you're checking her anyway, and you're saying, "Okay, well, where where are we in, in in you know as far as the position of the head?" Right. So at ten centimeters, it's really easy to feel the position of the head, but before that, it's kind of more tricky. I don't know. You know, there's studies that say thirty to sixty percent of the time, when a when a when a when a physician does an exam, an obstetrician, and says, "Oh, the baby's you know occiput anterior," that they're wrong. I mean, what about lot of not not just any even even midwives, but a lot of people are wrong about position, and I know that's true because I'm always thinking about position, and sometimes I'm wrong. So must be other people are wrong, right? Because if you're wrong, I mean everybody else has got to be wrong, right? They don't have any chance those people. So what about using an ultrasound to figure out the position? Very effective, and you can see the eyeballs, and you know exactly where the position is, and that's how they do these studies because they have people <laughs> check position, <laughs> and then they do an ultrasound and say, okay, you know, you know, we can grade you because we can see the actually baby is occiput posterior, not occiput anterior. But it is easy, not easy. You can sometimes confuse the anterior and posterior. It's not so obvious. If there's no molding and everything's wide open and you can feel the baby's head and everything's perfect, then, oh yeah, that's, this baby's occiput anterior, perfect. But if there's a lot of molding, molding means that the head is elongated, the bones have kind of um, kind of uh, moved into a, like a banana-shaped head where it's just really elongated. And then there's caput, which is all the swelling because all the pressure on the top of the head. So you got the swollen elongated head, it's sometimes it's hard to understand the position of said head. Right. So that baby is much harder and uh, you might feel the anterior fontanelle and think, oh, that's the posterior fontanelle and the baby's vertex 
is ox, ox, you know, oxygen anterior, but it's oxygen posterior. Right. So fontanelles are the soft tissue, you know, actually gaps in the baby's skull that Where fuse can later in life. Feel the ridges of the bones. They give you an idea of which direction. The and one is. shaped like a diamond, and the other one is shaped She's like a that. triangle. So I guess this is what I'm going with. Occipital posterior. I think it's much more common today than it was in yesteryear. Yeah, so why do you think that? I think because babies are bigger, they don't right. fit well. Right, so their bodies they don't fit are well, They don't rotate uh, because they would rotate, but they don't come down far enough to rotate. So we are just saying, oh, this baby's stuck for occipital posterior, but really the baby's stuck because it's fat. What and if, that's why the baby's not coming out. What about, so there's this whole theory on, on the internet about this lack of squat culture that women are sitting at a desk all day and then that's causing their uteruses to grow in a way that favors the posterior position. What do you think about that theory? Yeah, I'm not buying that at all. Okay, and then what What about back labor? Like when a woman is in, says she has back labor, do you think that means the baby is posterior? Because that's another very common belief on the internet. There is something to it because I've, I've seen many labor coaches say, oh, I think my baby patient's posterior. And you're like, why do I say, why do you think that? Oh, because she's got a lot of back labor. And I'm like, hmm, and then they're posterior. I'm like, okay, maybe there's something to it, but yes. Uh, I could buy that because, A, I see it, and, and there might be a physiological connection between back labor or pain in the back and a baby that's posterior. I'll, uh, I really don't know why one would lead to the other, but I bet some neurophysiologist could figure that out. Right, so I think the theory is like the occiput is pressing on the coccyx, which is, you know, or the sacrum, which is causing that back pain, and then that's where women feel the majority of their contractions, and then boom, she doesn't feel the labor in her back anymore, and now everybody knows the baby's anterior and the labor progresses smoothly. I mean, I think that's the leading theory. So I think um, if I if somebody said to me, how can I prevent occipital posterior? The answer, my answer would be, well, the best you could do is uh, have a baby that's body is not going to hold the head back so that the baby can rotate when it's supposed to. Sometimes it's earlier and sometimes later. And if you do have occipital posterior, have a doctor that's not going to just say, okay, you know, you've been pushing for three hours, it's time for a C-section. Right. They should have a skill set. And that skill set would be really nice if they could use assisted vaginal delivery. What is assisted vaginal delivery, Kristen? Tell the audience what, what I mean by that. What are, the, what are the tool tools we have? Well, I think there's a lot of different tools, but the main ones that people think about is they think about vacuum, you know, and forceps. Right. And those are, you know, I think vacuum is not as scary. It doesn't sound scary. I think forceps is a little more scary. But a vacuum is a suction cup you put on the baby's head. Uh, you pump up the suction so that you get a, a kind of a, uh, a sticking to the head and it sticks better if there's not a lot of hair. And, um, and then when the mother pushes, um, that, that extra pull from the provider, from the, from the delivering practitioner, is sometimes enough to get even a posterior baby out um, if the mother you know been pushing for long enough and she's like exhausted and you're like kind of, okay, I, I need you know something to help get this baby out. Uh, a vacuum is very helpful. And sometimes the real answer is a, a forceps, which is actually those large salad tongue salad looking blades that, yeah. that you put on the baby's head and then you articulate them so you have a nice big vice grip and you pull the baby out. Right. And and we can talk about them more in detail in another podcast because I think there's enough to talk about a whole other podcast oh, yes. on them. There's a lot to talk about and we should because I think people are, are scared of them and they shouldn't necessarily be. Right. Another way to assist and, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth on this and I know you and one of the other doctors we work on work with kind of feel differently about the manual rotation of the baby's head. So if a woman is posterior and she's pushing that the provider can actually go in and rotate the baby's head one way or the other. Right. So I've always been a little suspicious because, I don't know, I've been in the trenches for years and years and I've tried rotating many heads and they always just rotate Right back. Right back. I mean, even if I get the, I mean, get the head to turn, that, that happens. But then you take your hand out and the head goes back to right where it was. And I also know that, you know, sometimes as the baby's delivering, the head rotates right in front of you and, you know, maybe... This, you could just be, look what I did. Yes, exactly. People are like taking credit for, for the baby. being right there. While that right, and I don't know unless everybody figured out rotation besides me. And one of our one of my partners, Dr. Ratzestorfer, uh, says, "Yeah, no, you can rotate ahead. I do it. It, it works." And I'm like, "Yeah, but but you're not sold." I'm like, "I'm not." Yeah. And then one time after I told him it never works, that week I actually rotated ahead and it came out. <laughs> right. So I'm not so sure. So maybe if it just, just only works like one in a hundred right. times. Right. Right. So I'm not so. I mean, listen. If you if you give me a pair of forceps, I could rotate ahead easily and pull it out. Right, that's not the same thing. It just doesn't it's happen. It's hard to believe. And it's I, true. I've, I've tried many a time. They're just not a very useful technique. A lot of times, when you try to turn the head, or you bring someone in who's an expert, like Dr. Ratzedorfer, to turn the head, like you've already been pushing so long that how do you know it's not just time that you've you know right. you so kind I of think hit the that right the head time? Something does rotate because it's going to rotate anyways. Listen, you, you, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with trying, and I still do. There's nothing, but 
but I don't think that's like the solution. I think the solution is um, a have a baby that fits, which means watch watch how you eat and make sure your baby's not oversized. B have have a provider that has some 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 tricks up their sleeve like forceps or vacuum and they're comfortable with them to get you over the hump if you get stuck there. Right. And then maybe get comfortable yourself and listen to our upcoming podcast about vacuum and forceps so you can feel comfortable and right. to know what you well, want to do. We should point eat out, out most posterior babies do come out. I mean, it's not like they all end up with a assisted vaginal liver or C section. Even especially if it's an occiput posterior baby in a multiparous woman, a woman who's had normal deliveries before can handle uh, much better can handle a OP baby and deliver that baby even sunny side up. Right, or a woman who has a small baby and the baby's just in the posterior so position. So we don't want the audience to think if you're OP, that's it. You know, that means you're having a C-section or, or you know, or an assisted delivery. Uh, most of the time, you can still push an OP baby out. It just if you have the combination of first baby, big baby, posterior baby. Oh my gosh. It's yeah, a big... The odds are really high you're going to end up with a C-section. Right. If you don't come to us, of course. Your odds are going to be high if you end up with a C-section, even if you do come to us. But we could try. We could try. So we talked a little bit about like when it matters in labor, when the when the baby's posterior. But really what it is, is once the baby's dropped into the pelvis, that's really when posterior, anterior matters. Well, not only that, you can say that even if you end up doing a C-section because the baby was posterior and plus two... I can't be sure that that's the reason why the baby got stuck. Maybe it would have rotated if, you know, came down. Maybe the body was still the culprit and that not the head. So I don't think we ever know. I think all of these things have come to contr contribute to babies that are just too big and sometimes get stuck. And then we blame occiput posterior and we blame, you know, a lot of things. And we should really be thinking about the size of the baby's body. Right. Okay. So what's the takeaway for, for women? So the takeaway is that. Don't have a baby that's too big. Watch your carb intake when you're... Very important. Watch your carbs. Get exercise every day. Monitor the size of the baby. And try to find a practitioner who is... Um, Well-versed in assisted vaginal delivery. And maybe consider a labor coach or a doula to help you with the positioning, the peanut ball, the the right. rebozo uh, uh, technique. Having if you don't have an epidural... Having somebody encourage you to push and... and the, you know, somebody who's experienced and keeping you focused makes a difference. I, I always like to think of uh, obstetrics like football. You know, there's an expression in football that football is a game of inches. What do you think that means? Well, that's how they're won, right? Like the ball's yeah, on but the... Yeah, specifically, it's not a game of yards, right? If you talk about football, it's 10 yards to a first down, 100 yards to the field, right? There's, you know, five-yard penalty. What's... Why do they... Right, like why, every... So where's the expression like that slowly, football's a game of inches? Right, like slowly over time. You're like... It's kind of like grain, sand grains in an hourglass. Like. Exactly. So... The inches is what adds up to the yards, right? The extra two inches you got because of that play and the extra three inches you get because, you know, you're quicker off the ball than the other team. Those little things, they add up over the course of a game. And that's the difference between the winner and the loser. Those inches here and the inches there, not the 10 yards here and 10 yards there. And, and in pregnancy, I think of it that way because I think that when a woman's in labor, there's so many factors. And one of them is, you know, how well she's pushing or how good her labor coach is. And, and, and that's a few inches. And then, you know. Did she pick the right doctor? Right. And, and, every, and every one of them is, you know, like her strategy. And then she watched her car. And every, she did all these little things. And all of them maybe in, a, in themselves couldn't be that big of a deal. But when you put them all together, that's, that's enough to get her over, over, over the hump and get, you know, have that normal delivery. Great. So pregnancy is football. Everything's football. Life is football. <laughs> That wraps up our show about the occiput posterior position. If you have any more questions, we'd love to hear from you and you can reach out to us at truebirthpodcast.com. And remember to subscribe so you never miss an upcoming podcast. Mm -hmm.